We call the meeting to order. Uh, welcome to this October 5th meeting of the City Council. If you could please rise if you are able, pay attention to Deputy Mayor Padilla for the invocation to be followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this evening, Father Ray May from Our Lady of Guadalupe Parish uh, will be with us. Father May, though he was born in Little Rock, Arkansas, has lived in the Chicago area, and Father May has lived most of his life in Kansas. He considers himself to be from Topeka. He graduated from Shawnee Heights High School in 1984 and went on to study astronomy and physics at Benedictine College in Atchison, Kansas. After graduating from Benedictine in 1988, he entered the seminary. Most of his theological studies were at University of Mary, of uh, St. Mary of the Lake in Mundelein. Is it Mundelein? Thank you. Mundelein, Illinois. Father May was ordained a priest in 1993 and has served as pastor in Emporia, St. Mary's, and Rossville. This is his second time being assigned to Our Lady of Guadalupe Parish, and I know, Father, many in the parish are glad to see you come back. Thank you for being with us this evening. If you <clears throat> could step to the podium so to provide the invocations, Father. Let us pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, you have called us to be your servants. And this council gathers tonight as your servants of this community of Topeka, Kansas, and as their representatives. We ask for your wisdom, guidance, and support as we begin this meeting. Help those here tonight to truly speak for those whom they represent, and may the common good of all be our concern. Allow us to grow closer and to nurture the bonds of community. May this council engage in meaningful discussion, and may your wisdom and your will, O Lord, guide the decisions that are made. May we seek the true good always, and may we enjoy your blessings of greater peace and prosperity through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We now proceed with a roll call. Let's see. Mayor De La Isla. Here. Council members Hiller. Here. Valdivia Acala. Here. Ortiz. Here. Emerson. Here. Padilla. Here. Here. Nager. Dobler. Here. Duncan? Here. And Lesser? Here. We have nine present. Um, Councilwoman Nager called me and let me know that she was not going to be able to make it, but she will be following up with our live stream later on to make sure that she is abreast of all of the information that was discussed today.
the, the Topeka Fire Department, with the support of the American Red Cross, installs free smoke alarms and inspects hundreds of commercial structures annually in order to keep our citizens safe. And yes, they will go to your house too. Right, Councilwoman Ortiz? Yes. <laughs> Topeka firefighters are dedicated to reducing the occurrence of fires and injuries through prevention, protection, community risk reduction projects and education. The 2021 Fire Prevention Week theme is Learn the Sounds of Fire Safety. Now, therefore, I, Michelle de la Isla, Mayor of the City of Topeka, Kansas, do hereby proclaim the week of October 3rd through the 9th as Fire, Protect, uh, fire Prevention Week. And talk to us about learning the sounds of fire safety, Chief. Well, actually, this is uh, Fire Marshal Todd's. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, we really appreciate yeah. this. Uh, every year there's a theme to uh, fire prevention and, and fire safety for October. This year, like say, you learn the sound of fire, uh, the fire sounds. And that involves people getting, uh, sorry. this involves uh, families uh, making sure that they test their uh, smoke detectors, uh, provide a good plan of action. <laughs> but this is, this involves the families making sure that they uh, check their smoke detectors, have a plan for getting out of the house uh, if the smoke detector does go off. And like you said, very well, uh, if you don't have a smoke detector, go to the fire department website, fill out that application, and our guys would love to come out and install one in your house. Uh, once again, I know the city council feels the same way that the fire department does. Safety first. We do really appreciate this uh, proclamation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Councilwoman Ortiz, I'm opening up the floor to you because I know that this is something very important to you as well. Thank you, Madam Mayor, for that. I appreciate it. I would like to challenge all my colleagues to catch up with um, Council Member Duncan, who has, I believe he said, 15 smoke detectors in his house. So I'd like to make that challenge to everyone so that we're all safe like the Duncans. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, thank and you. we appreciate your service to our community. Thank you. All right. Now we have Home Rule Day. Um, this one is, is important to all of us in our communities because it's, it's the ability of cities to be able to make their own determinations, and it's something that we, um, believe it or not, had to advocate for this last session in the legislature. So. It's one of those things that it's important for us to know that as cities, we are able to make policies that are for the betterment of our communities without having to have additional oversight. So this one is near and dear to the council. So it states that whereas for the first 100 years of statehood, cities were entirely dependent on the powers granted to them by state legislature. And that changed on November 8, 1960. The voters of Kansas approved the constitutional amendment granting cities home rule authority. The Home Rule Amendment took effect in Kansas in July 1st, 1961. Through Home Rule, the people of Kansas granted cities the inherent power to govern and to make decisions at the local level based on the unique needs and values of their residents. Cities across our, our great state hold differing opinions and views on ranging a, a wide range of issues. Home Rule keeps control of the community in the hands of local residents. The Home Rule Amendment empowers cities to determine local affairs and government actions, including the levying of tax, fees, charges, and other exaction. But we're not gonna focus on the taxes today. <laughs> the City of Topeka and the League of Kansas Municipalities continue to work to educate and engage municipal elected officials, the legislator, and the general public about the importance of home rule and local decision making. Whereas the 60th anniversary of the passage of this Constitution on Home Rule is fitting for a time for all municipalities to engage with their residents about the Kansas Constitution and the importance of constitutional home rule in their communities. Therefore, I, Mayor Michelle de la Isla, Mayor of the City of Topeka, Kansas, do hereby proclaim October 11th, 2021 as Home Rule Day.
We now proceed with the consent agenda. If the clerk would read. Item 3A is an ordinance introduced by City Manager Brent Kraut allowing and approving city expenditures for the period July 31st, 2021 through August 27th, 2021 and enumerating said expenditures therein. Item B are the minutes of the regular meeting of September 21st, 2021 and there are no applications. We have heard the consent agenda. What is the pleasure of the governing body? Mayor, move approval. We have approval second. by Councilman Emerson and second by Councilman Dobler. Do we have any comments or questions? Seeing none, we proceed by voting. Council Members Duncan? Yes. Lesser? Yes. Mayor De La Isla? Yes. Council Members Hiller? Yes. Valdivia Acala? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Emerson? Yes. Padilla? Yes. Dobler? Yes. We have nine voting yes. None having voted yes. The motion carries. We now move on to the action items. Action item A, if the clerk would read. Item A is a resolution approving the issuance by the City of Wichita, Kansas of its health care facilities revenue bonds for the purpose of financing or refinancing the acquisition, construction, improvement, and equipping of senior living health care facilities located in the City of Topeka, Kansas. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. The City of Wichita notified the City of Topeka of Wichita's intent to issue health care facility revenue bonds in an amount not to exceed $200 million to finance improvements to various Presbyterian Manor senior living facilities. One of those facilities is located here in Topeka. According to KSA 12-1741A, it prohibits Wichita from issuing revenue bonds to finance facilities outside the city unless Wichita receives the approval of the city where the facility is located and the Topeka, or the Topeka governing body takes no action within seven days after meeting to consider the matter. If approved, the bonds are special obligations of the City of Wichita, payable from rental payments by Presbyterian Manors Incorporated. The City of Topeka has no financial liability for these payments. We have heard the item. Are there questions for the City Manager? Councilman Dobler. Well, the uh, City of Wichita is in town selling bonds. Could we stick a few water lines and <laughs> a street project or two in here? I'll check with Bring Bob. it on. Let's see if they don't okay. say it. I'll check with them. Thank you. Comments or questions? What is the pleasure of the governing body? Motion to approve. Motion for approval by the Deputy Mayor. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Councilman Lesser. Additional comments or questions? Seeing none, we proceed by voting. Councilmember Lesser? Yes. Mayor De La Isla? Yes. Councilmember Heller? Yes. Valdiva Acala? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Emerson? Yes. Padilla? Yes. Dobler? Yes. Duncan? Yes. We have nine voting yes. Nine having voted yes, the motion carries. We now move on to item B, if the clerk would read. Item B is an ordinance introduced by Council Member Sylvia Ortiz concerning private towing of abandoned vehicles, adding new section 10.25.080. Councilwoman Ortiz, AKA Councilwoman Fire Prevention Week. <laughs> Thank you. Um, approval would enable private towing. Um, it would put them where they need to be legally operators to impose a lien on vehicles towed from private property and to auction the vehicles in accordance with state law if unclaimed by the vehicle owner. Um, I don't know if Mr. Arredondo's there, if anybody has any questions. We kind of went over this last time, but he's got about 30 or 40 cars that he can't get rid of without this ordinance being passed. Um, I'll, I'll stand for approval. Are there questions or comments for not only Councilwoman Ortiz, but also she has Mr. Arredondo here for additional questions. Councilman Duncan. I just had some two quick general comments, no no specific questions. Last last week I, or whenever we met, two weeks ago, whenever that was, I raised two issues. The first, I wanna thank staff 
for putting it more in detail for as a city ordinance as opposed to just saying we'll follow the county. I think that gives us more flexibility if the county makes changes or we want to make a change and it just makes it a little easier for us. So I appreciate their efforts in rewriting it that way for us. Um, the second thing was I, I had some questions about the, the rates and the fees in here. Talked with staff a little, talked to the police department, looked at some other counties and I'm okay with, I mean, I feel better now. They're pretty standard compared to what others in Kansas are doing. And so I, I feel much better about the rates. So I, I will support this this evening. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, sir. Additional comments or questions? Seeing none, what is the pleasure of the governing body? Councilwoman uh, uh, Ortiz moves approval. Councilwoman Dolber seconds. Additional comments or questions before we proceed with the vote? We proceed with the vote. Council members Hiller? Yes. Valdiva Akala? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Emerson? Yes. Padilla? Yes. Dobler? Yes. Duncan? Yes. Lesser? Yes. We have eight voting yes. Eight having voted yes, the motion carries. We now move on to item C of the clerk would read. Item C is a resolution introduced by city manager Brent Trout consenting to the establishment of Shawnee County Main Sewer District number 74, lateral, lateral district number nine. City manager. Thank you, Mayor. A developer of the Sherwood Park subdivision has filed a petition with the Shawnee County Board of Commissioners to establish a sewer district that would service this new subdivision as a sewer district would extend to the city limits, state law requires consent by the city. The petition has been reviewed by the appropriate city departments and staff has no accept objection. Questions for staff. What is the pleasure of the governing body? Motion to approve. Councilman second. Lesser moves approval. Deputy Mayor seconds. There's no additional comments or questions. We proceed by voting. Council members Valdivia Akala? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Emerson? Yes. Padilla? Yes. Dobler? Yes. Duncan? Yes. Lesser? Yes. Mayor De La Isla? Yes. Council member Hiller? Yes. We have nine voting yes. None haven't voted yes. The motion carries. We move on to item D, if the clerk would read. Item D is an ordinance introduced by City Manager Brent Trout adopting the 2021 Standard Traffic Ordinance STO and local amend amendments thereto, amending Topeka Municipal Code sections 10.15.010 and 10.15.020. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this item was covered and presented during discussion item last meeting, and there was a revised memo that was produced related to this item by the city attorney. City Attorney Stanley can answer any questions that you may have regarding this item. Questions for staff. Councilwoman Hiller. Thank you, Mayor. I just have one comment. I appreciate the update in the um, in the narrative that came with it, I thought it was perfect. Just enough information, not too much, but enough that you understood what was in each one. So thank you for that. Yeah. Pleasure of the body. Move approval. Thank you, Councilwoman Hiller. Second. Councilman Dobler. Comments or questions? Seeing none, we proceed by voting. Council members Ortiz. Yes. Emerson? Yes. Padilla? Yes. Dobler? Yes. Duncan? Yes. Lesser? Yes. Hiller? Yes. Valdivia Akala? Yes. We have eight voting yes. Eight having voted yes, the motion carries. We move on to item E, if the clerk would read. Item E is an ordinance introduced by City Manager Brent Trout adopting the 30, 37th edition of the Uniform Public Offense Code 
2021 UPOC and local amendments thereto amending Topeka Municipal Code section 9.05.080. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. The same is true of this particular item. Um, this is an item that was discussed last meeting and prepared for approval. Questions of staff. Pleasure of the body. Thank Councilman you. Emerson makes a motion, seconded by Councilman Emerson. <laughs> Did I say the same name twice? Yes. <laughs> but he's always wanted to be. Lesser and Emerson. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's no other questions or comments. We proceed with the vote. Council members Emerson? Yes. Padilla? Yes. Dobler? Yes. Duncan? Yes. Yes. Lester? Yes. Hiller? Yes. Valdivia Akala? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. We have eight voting yes. Eight have been voted yes. The motion carries. We move on to item F, if the clerk would read. F is an ordinance introduced by City Manager Brent Trout concerning governing body meetings in January following general municipal elections amidst City of Topeka Code Section 2.15.020 and repealing original section. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. This really is a two-step um, ordinance change. The, in 2015, state law established the swear-in day for elected officials after the November election to be the second Monday in January. Um, then in 2019, and so we modified our agenda and instead of meeting on the second Tuesday, we met on the second Monday. In 2019, the state law changed again and established that cities could establish their own date for when they swear in individuals after the November election. We established that date as the first Tuesday of the month of January, and so unless it falls on the holiday of January 1st. Um, so tonight what we're asking to do is eliminate the uh, ordinance that we have that says we meet on the second Monday of the month of January and this would allow us to then meet on the second Tuesday as we typically would. Questions? Councilwoman Hiller. Move to approve. We have a second. Second. Councilman Emerson. Comments or questions? Seeing none, we proceed by voting. Council members Padilla? Yes. Dobler? Yes. Duncan? Yes. Lesser? Yes. Hiller? <coughs> yes. Valdivia Akala? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Emerson? Yes. We have eight voting yes. It having voted yes, the motion carries. Just wanted to make a quick mention the fact that this meeting where we celebrated home rule ended up having several ordinances that were home rule, which is why the mayor is Correct. not voting in some of these. It's not that I'm asleep on the job. All right, we move on to the non-action items. Non-action item A. Item A is a discussion regarding the finalization of the city's ARPA funding project list. City manager. Thank you, mayor. Well, tonight, my purpose is to have the initial spending proposal presented to you. This will not be the last time we discuss this. I already have it planned for three additional meetings, two that would be discussion and one that would be where we would seek to take action. Um, you'll see in the presentation that some of the information is carryover. I wanted to keep the basic information that I presented the first time the same. So I will skip that part and really shift right away into what is uh, page seven, slide seven, which is the co-responder. So if you can forward the slide seven. So there are a number of different issues that we're allowed to support with this ARPA money. The first program that I would consider as a part of the public health response is the SAVE program. The SAVE program we know about, it's a program to reduce uh, violence. It's a violence intervention type program. And so it fits under this category. The 90,000 that you see there is three years worth of funding for that organization, 30,000 30, a year. The next program, it says Crisis Intervention Counselor. After working with the Chief of Staff, he's provided some additional information, and this really truly actually is the co-responder program. We've talked about it in the past where you would pair a EMT, a police officer, a mental health professional together as a team, 
and they would go out into the community and respond to other situations. Um, that right now we're looking at funding is about 1.5 million, not the 350,000. As I stated, this is a fluid document, and this change occurred after I presented this in the packet. The co-responder program is something that has been talked about for a while as an option to be able to help support both mental health and other issues medically for individuals within the community. And we can provide a greater detail as to what the team consists of. Chief has already made a, a basically, I would say, a white paper that explains what the team would do and also what the team would be comprised of. Uh, we would have vehicles that would need to be purchased in this initial year to help with that process um, to support them. So we'll bring more detail at the next meeting, but right now that figure changes to 1.5, and you'll see another location that represents MAP that will be reduced down to 500,000. So follow along. And then, uh, so if we go to ne negative economic impacts, which is slide nine. So there's a whole long list. This is intended to be programs that will help our community address some social needs that we have within our community. COVID basic needs is a program that we've been using for a while. We received money from federal government to help us and then we supplemented that and it also with some CARES Act money that we had previously received. This would add another $350,000 to that. We primarily right now are only using that money to assist with people that have a need for back mortgage issues, that they've been affected by COVID and, and then have mortgage issues. We've pushed, we have other funding that we receive from CDBG that supports utilities and uh, rent assistance and another, so we're pushing them towards those funds because those have a sunset date in 2022. So working through that. JADO business grant reimbursement. Um, this past year, JADO made the decision to provide some funding to be able to help some businesses. The total amount that was expended by JADO was 700,000. In discussions with our county counterparts across the parking lot, we are sharing that. They're, they would utilize part of their CARES Act or their ARPA money to cover and we would cover the other half. So 350 for us and 350 for them. The next one is the map I mentioned. We would change that from 2 million down to 500,000. That basically will cover the Wheels of Change program that's been mentioned and some of the other outreach programs that they do. The jobs training program is to assist individuals to be trained for new skills or issues for some of the businesses that we have in our community right now trying to make sure that individuals that could possibly utilize some additional vocational training or whatever that will allow them to get a job in some of the many manufacturers and others that we have that have needs for skilled workforce. And we would partner with our local um, tech or Washburn Tech and Washburn Tech East to be able to accomplish that. Now that needs to be more needs to be placed around that is simply a concept. We haven't had any meetings with them or any of that type of thing, but we know that this is an allowed function and we often hear about it as a need within our community. So there would be work to do to develop the actual program. The Math Crisis Center from Sal with Salvation Army in a conversation in one-on-one -on -one meeting with Councilwoman Valdivia Apple, as she mentioned, there is a program that Salvation Army has that assists individuals, students with help and it's a Math Crisis Center. And if she would want to comment any further on that, He's welcome to. Thank you, city manager. I know in the whole scheme of things, this $10,000 is like a, a crumb, but it's a crumb that Salvation Army would be very grateful to have because what this is about is helping children in uh, 501 schools that due to the ramifications from COVID and learning from home and getting behind, et cetera, are going into the Salvation Army to receive after school t uh, tutoring. I think that it speaks volumes, volumes, that it actually was not even $10,000. That's how uncertain they were that the city would be open to listening to what they needed for these children and for the tutors. And so it was actually up to, um, like $3,000. And so I think that that speaks really to um, that up close and personal need that is out there for our children. And um, 
If I would have known it could have been more, it would have been more, but that's where we're at right now. And that's it, thanks. Um, the next one, Impact Avenues, that's a program that we've been running. There was a local business, uh, Advisors Excel, that gave the initial funding for that program. And we've been running on that funding for a while. That funding is due to expire. And so it is a very important program that assists homeless children for using a lot of wraparound services that they receive additional funding for. So it often helps the children and the families to find a stable environment, new home, uh, housing, and so forth. And so this would continue the program for, I believe it's three years. Um, broadband Digital Literacy Program, uh, initially when I looked at this, we had $100,000 at this location. From discussions with others, we decided to move that up to 200000 in order to be able to make sure that over the next three years we're able to fully fund that. Um, property Maintenance Program, uh, and it says like FHLB Program, that's the Federal Home Loan Bank Program. We received a grant uh, of $750,000 from Federal Home Loan Bank to assist with improving properties within the community if they were to come to the court and be assessed that they had a fine to pay based on their, something that needed to be fixed on their home. They would then be eligible to receive some funding to make that fix to their home. This would provide another 250000 towards that program. We have applied for a million dollar grant uh, from the same program, but we have not heard and it would not be available for a period of time. So we wanted to continue the program and the work that it's done <laughs> with a small stipend in order to keep it rolling. Um, next program is the demolition of the Van Duren Buren School for affordable housing. The city did a contract a while back with, uh, with Pioneer Group to demo the van, or to actually first it started out to use the Van Buren School as a housing project and then also build additional housing around that area on city lots. They have since transitioned and to now that property is owned by Topeka Housing Authority Inc. And they have contacted me about the school is in such disrepair that it needs to be demolished in order for them to be able to do a project. But if they could get the demolition done, they would then be able to create affordable housing in that location. And this look, you know, if you know this location, this is around seven, between 17th and 16th, um, just off of Kansas. And so it's an important area that to put some new housing into that particular part of the community would be very beneficial with its location to downtown and, and so forth. And so um, that small assistance to them would allow them to move forward with creating additional housing. Um, affordable Housing Trust Fund, um, there has been a request that we include some money from this funding, which is allowed to assist with housing projects. And this is simply a place number. I think this is something that we have an interest in uh, trying to support, but I'm not sure if the full governing body feels the support of this nature is necessary out of this money, but it's simply a placeholder for the discussion as it's been requested by a number of people in the community that we consider providing uh, some assistance towards that trust fund from this money. Land bank program. We've been talking about creating a land bank program for a while. And so in order to keep it going, we consider it. This was some funding in order to be able to move that project forward. I'll stop there and answer any questions before turning the page. Questions for city manager. Council Councilwoman Valdivia Alcala. Thank you. Um, Mayor, can we go back to the beginning of where you were? When you the first previous came? page? Yeah, seven. Was it yes. page seven? Okay. Um, you said that uh, Chief would be giving a white paper. Can we actually get a detailed presentation on what this is going yes, to Yes, we could do that at the entail? next meeting just as well, yes. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, also, the job training program. If you said where this was going to go through, I missed it. Can you tell me again? Where it would go to? Where the program would be. My intent would of. be is we'd work with our already existing tech schools. Now, if there was someone else that somebody was aware of beyond Washburn Tech or Washburn Tech East as a location that has a program that a, and somebody within our community is looking for trained workforce from, I'd be willing to uh, consider that as well. It doesn't have to be those organizations, but that was, to me, the logical choice based on some of the programs that we've seen come out of their organization in the past. Okay, and so you said that this is all in developmental stage? I mean, this Yes, is that is truly a concept. 
only. I haven't had conversations with either of those organizations about what their needs might, you know, where they're short, where they could use assistance in order to make it happen. But it's put on there because job training is a program that's allowed to be, that we can utilize this money on. And often it seems like we don't have enough job training dollars to get people to be able to have a new skill. And so it, since it's allowed under the program, I put it here as a placeholder and then we can have a discussion about whether or not it stays or goes and in what amount. Okay, and however that ends up getting uh, developed, I hope that folks that are within the community that have a vested interest in their community that have familiarity with how these programs may run are at the table sure. rather than professionals that don't have the stakes that community people do are all sitting around making decisions for them. Right. And, and the other thing I would request a presentation is this moves more deeply so that we see how the money is actually going to be spent. Right. And, and the nice thing is, is we have three years to implement and spend right. this money or actually to obligate it, encumber it. Mm -hmm. And so the development of the program is not something we have to do immediately. Mm -hmm. um, we can take our time to figure out exactly what the best need, you know, where the needs are and organize all of it. And it may be that next year none of it's spent, but we work on developing the program. Okay. And when it comes to broadband, broadband digital literacy program, is that going to be an extension for um, employ the cost of positions added on to what the grant gave from the Kansas Health Foundation? I think it Health would be Foundation? patterned similar to it. I think if we find that that's, that program is successful, then we would pattern it after that. Or if we'd identified another need that is related to broadband, then we could surely modify it. So, for example, we're, I'm still, and some other, several other folks are still in conversation with Lazone Grays about the possibility, which he's been talking about for at least a year, if not longer, about digital hubs uh, in underserved communities. And a number of those, you know, we already have what some of those locations could be. Now there's going to be a dollar sign attached to that, and he's going to, I think, be presenting that, you know, shortly. So if that would be something, because you said in, in our meeting that I had with you, you said infrastructure, like the computer equipment and all of that could be purchased. Um, do I have to set up another meeting with you or does he come up and make public comment? How do we get that in there as part of our conversation as we move forward? Well, I think uh, surely having public comment wouldn't, would not be an issue as far as providing more detail on what he would envision and then we could see if that's the direction that we would want to go. Okay, and... and I want yes, to make one, one thing that was mentioned in the conversation with Councilman Ortiz related to the job training program. Also, the way I envisioned was that there would be child care that would be provided for those individuals that need to go to job training so that they can have that support while they, so they can attend the job training that's necessary. Thank you, because I was going to ask about that. Yeah. Um, I have one more question about what I'm seeing for negative economic uh, impacts, and I'm trying to go to the page where it has, you might have to tell me what page is on, with NOTO on it, and TPAC, and... That's the next page. page. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, you haven't got to that. I haven't got there so I'm ahead of the game. Well, Thank it's a little you. different order. Uh, yeah, that's, that's all I have. Thank you, City Manager. Councilwoman Hiller. I, I have I probably have a lot of detailed questions, but overall, when I'm looking at the suggestions about basic needs assistance, jobs, and so on, it, what is is this an assumption that it's um, it's a need that exists now um, that we're needing to catch up with, or that these challenges that people have faced? I mean, right now we're at sort of full employment, and people are looking for employees, and so you know, people not having income to pay their rent well, or needing training, just... It ends up being a kind of a combination. Okay. You know, it, this is something that's available. In other words, it is a program that you can support financially. So providing COVID basic needs assistance is available to be able to, you can provide ARPA money to support that type of activity. The same is true of job training. It's an activity that can be supported by ARPA. I think there is a need but truly identifying what that need is is some work, additional work that's available. If as a, as a council, governing body, you determine that that's less of a need, then 
other needs that are listed or capable where we can spend the money, then we would eliminate it from the program. So the key here is to make sure that you have full knowledge that that is a program that can be considered. <coughs> Excuse me. But if at some point through this deliberation is determined that that's less important than something else, it could be removed from the program. And so it, what I felt was important is that we make sure that you know what your options are as we go through this and put a number on it and then allow you to understand that it's something you can consider. And, and if I can <coughs> follow up, just kind of check in what the crystal ball has been when you all have talked about sure. this, whether you're expecting that, that this next three years would, would need to be programming that was reactive to COVID or just programming. Well, and I think the program itself from the federal level was the intention that this is something that is needed in many of the communities that have been affected by COVID. Understood. In a blanket statement. Mm -hmm. And so that's why there are allowable programs under the ARPA, ARPA program. And so we may determine that it's less of a need in, in our community and we want to put our money into water and sewer projects instead of a job training program. And that's okay. But if we were to not even have it on the list, then I don't think that allows for the full discussion. Well, that's fine. I just wondered if you were thinking we were still going to be reactive the way we were last Understood. year, let's say. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Dobler. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, a lot of different programs, a lot of money. I think as we move forward, you know, having sat for several years on the United Way committees, um, we always talked about outcomes mm -hmm. for these things. What are the anticipated outcomes and then accounting for that at some point down the road, sure. what actually happened. Whatever the program is, I, I like all these programs. I think this is a great start, but certainly want to see before a dollar is spent that we understand what the anticipated outcomes are and then have the opportunity to review that on an annual basis. Agreed. So, that is critical. We want to make sure that we're accounting to the public and eventually the federal government the same way we have reporting that we're doing things then and, and what they accomplish when we spend this money. Very critical. Great. Thank you. Okay. okay, so we'll go to page 10 or slide 10. Um, Madam Mayor. Councilwoman Ortiz. Thank you. I want to I want to make this clear on the job training or the job training program with the child care. The scenario I gave is not necessarily the uh, job training program. Um, I want to make sure that, well, actually, it's, it's a twofold. I want to make sure why they're going through the program that they get child care. A sing right now, there's a lot of single parents mm -hmm. that don't have anybody to watch their kids. So it's hard for them to go interview. It's hard for them to get out there and to apply for jobs. Um, so what, what are they going to do with the kids? And so that's what I'm, I'm seeing a lot of. And then also why they go through job training, um, you know, to make sure that they have that child care um, availability to them, whether it's however many hours or how you do it. I think, I think that's very, very crucial. So not just through going through school, but also through the um, applying process. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Okay, good clarification. Um, on the next page, on page 10, we talked about uh, continuing that transient guest tax lost revenue replacement. Probably one of the biggest areas where we lost revenue was in our transient guest tax. The amount of hotel rooms that were actually taken during that time frame was significantly reduced. The impact was felt by our uh, Visit Topeka organization. They primarily fund their organization through the receipts of transient guest tax. And so they showed to me a document that roughly 1.1 million was lost between all of the fund areas where transient guest tax receives funds over the last year uh, from the pandemic. Um, this amount is 600,000. It doesn't fully fund the loss that they occurred, but it provides um, a breakdown of around 300,000 towards the Visit Topeka organization itself. It funds all of the organizations that we provide from the 1% group, which was uh, Constitution Hall, uh, down there in my memory. Um, let's see, it was Evil Knievel, but we would hold on that. Then we would do um, the other other three. I'm trying to think of the other Jayhawk. two. Jayhawk. What? Jayhawk Theater. Yeah, Constitution Hall, 
and gosh, anyway. So those organizations, in addition, there's 1% that goes to the soccer folks, and so this would give them a portion of their loss back, and then it would also give some additional funding back to visit Topeka to help with their efforts to market the community. Um, Noto tourism loss, there were some impacts related to, to tur tourism in Noto, and so this would be a small amount that would go back to them in order to be able to help with some issues related to their operations. TPAC, it is both operations lost money and also capital projects, and how that breakdown would occur, we would still need to talk. But that $2 million would help with the backlog of projects that we know occur at a need to be done in TPAC. And this is a way for us to pursue that. Uh, SUFA information signs is an interesting one. Um, we were informed by an organization that has a sign that is a message board. And it is similar to a kiosk and that there are messages that are, you can program on there and have those in various locations within the community. And so this was an option that would then allow us to be able to broadcast what some of our programs we have in the community. And uh, I know that uh, downtown Topeka is looking at this as a possible item for them to purchase as well. So this would be us and them making some of these purchases. Um, and then external audit support, when we get done with all this, we're going to need to have a review. Currently, the finance department will be submitting our reports. We have quarterly reports that are due for the funding as we go. And so we submitted our initial report. That was accepted, and now we have our next quarterly report. They postponed the due date to January. It was supposed to be the end of October, um, but they moved that back to January. Um, but eventually, we will have regular reports that we do, and then eventually we'll have a review by an external audit at the end of all this. Any questions on those? Um, Councilman Valdivia, I'll, if you don't mind. As city manager, one of the things that other mayors have been doing is not only having an audit organization post action, but also making sure that we have a firm that we can consult with to ensure that the uses of the funds that we're allocating are actually appropriate. Um, we have history. Some of the mayors were sharing stories of in the past, they had received the bulk of funds and then they were making the allocations and the challenge that we have with this guidance is that it's broad enough, but not clear as well, kind of, that we have to make sure that we are meeting those guidelines and that we don't misuse any funds inadvertently. Mm -hmm. So it would be wonderful if we would consider also having a third party that would help us also audit before we make those expenditures as the council body starts determining the direction of the funds. Council on Valdivia Alcala. Thank you, Mayor. Um, on the amount for NOTO, when you and I had our meeting, initially it had 50000 now it's taken down to 30000 And I'd given you a document, um, a quick document that I'd received from Tom Underwood uh, about their goal and how much that they were uh, asking for. And just let me say that I'm going to be having a meeting week after next with Tom Underwood and all the NOTO businesses because they want to not only develop uh, the budget with specifically what they've asked for, but also sign it in a, in a petition format or if they need to do public comment. And when I see the decrease, even though, you know, 30,000 out of all of this is kind of like chunk change, um, you know, I, I just need to say a couple of things here. And I know that these are discussions, so there could be movement in this area is that perhaps only one to two businesses that received any kind of COVID assistance were NOTO businesses. Uh, we also have to consider that they continue to wait for the city to demolish a vacant building that um, it should really be considered a public health and safety issue. So they're also waiting on that. They received no tax, the transient guest tax funds. And I know that there's a criteria where these funds have to go so many years out, but that's the bottom line. They don't get any transient test uh, uh, tax funds. And now we see this again, we're just in discussions from 50 to $30,000. Uh, I would also remind uh, people that uh, it is the third most popular, NOTO is the third most popular tourist destination in the county following Lake Shawnee and state capital. That uh, first or second or third place has been consistent uh, for them. Um, they also got voted the best place to take 
an out-of-towner to. Uh, based on that information, there are many uh, that feel in Noto that they actually uh, bring in more tourism and revenue than downtown. So I think that we really start have to start having some serious conversation about uh, the feeling due through the actions or inactions uh, of, you know, city and whoever the givers out of the money are, the money gods, um, about what folks keep saying that they're going to do with NOTO, but then don't actually do. And they are thriving. They are not going anywhere. They are committed. And I think that um, I would like to have more detailed conversation about this. Thank you. Other comments or questions? The only thing I know that it's, it's this afternoon, Brent and I had a conversation with regards to this, and he just reminded me yet again, this is not the final. Um, this does not um, imply that these are final, and I don't even think that this even starts to touch the amount of money that the city um, was allocated. As a body, when we are looking at these things, Councilman Dober talked about outcomes. I really want to invite us all, as we're looking at these, to try to group them in long-term impact opportunity that we could have for our community. Um, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that we will have this amount of money coming through our hands. And I am excited to see a lot of the things that are being funded here, but I think that as we keep moving forward and refining this initial list, it's important that we start thinking about where we can make some significant investments that are going to really transform the lives of our citizens. Um, I know that you know one of the conversations that we had was that we are waiting for the for the money that that's being talked about for infrastructure, and we are excited about that because there's significant potential for our community um, as that comes forth, and that could leave a significant legacy for us. But these specific dollars, as we're talking about the the social impact in our community. Um, I, I appreciate the comments of Councilwoman Ortiz. Uh, I've had, just in the last two days, um, conversations, one of them with one of my mentors, expressing some frustration that his perception is that people are at home and not working. And um, a lot of the individuals that I know that are home not working are not working because the benefits allow them to stay at home with their kids and not leave their kids alone. Um, Childcare is $800 a month per infant um, and $500 to $600 for toddlers. And then it keeps going down as you keep putting kiddos in childcare. So as a parent, if your job doesn't pay you enough for you to pay for childcare, the difficult position is not being placed upon you by the economy. It's a choice, right? I mean, I know that not everybody can pay significant amounts of money but I'm just trying to provide a perspective as we're trying to figure out what are the entry barriers for individuals to return and even come back into the workforce. Um, so just, just some food for thought for us because yet again today in the Go Topeka meeting at three o'clock, one of the things that Molly was talking about is as we're talking to people and people are considering where to go to uh, make their, their community the next big place that they're going to employ people in, the number one concern is workforce. It's workforce. And I think that as that we have a really big responsibility to figure out how we can eliminate that and invite people back into the, the workforce by I love the idea that Councilwoman Ortiz was talking about providing child care. Uh, so just some thoughts. We do have additional public comment. I do not see Mr. Jonathan Sublet. We're, We're not done. Not quite through, Mayor. Oh. Getting close. I got two more. No, two it's more public comment for this cover. item. He's not done yet. Oh, okay. My bad. No, <laughs> The next one shouldn't take terribly long, but um, <laughs> the other area, the third area that we can do funding from ARPA is revenue loss and working uh, finance department, working with Jeff White and through the formulas that they have available through the uh, ARPA uh, regulation, they will determine that probably there was a loss of, a calculated loss of over 10 million that we could claim. Um, I have put down a number of 6,000 to claim for revenue loss in order to be able to use dollars. Now, that can always be changed, and we could do a different number if we had another need that you couldn't cover in the other designated areas. When you have revenue loss money, you can utilize it for any governmental function that we would do. 
So anything that we would do as a government, pay staff, do whatever. If we would do it as a government and it's allowed, we can use the revenue loss money, pave a street, whatever we want to do. And that's the only way, for example, some of this stuff can be done. Can't use the rest of the money for, if it's not revenue loss connected, can't use it to pave a street. So what I have done is listed off a series of projects underneath the revenue loss category. Um, One million dollars to go to the parking fund to do a capital project whatever they would determine they would need. City Hall, the ventilation project that was not done on City Hall, there's 3.3 million that would be allocated for that. Using 600,000 towards mill and overlay projects, 500,000 for curb and gutter. Looking at utilizing some of the funding to do our blight abatement and mowing crews in order to make a dent and move forward. I think that goes hand in hand with some of the things we've been talking about in the property and premises in order to get a handle on some of that. Um, potentially, if uh, we can hire the four we're looking for, potentially hire two, you can pay with two more property maintenance inspectors for a period of time, and then some additional small projects, which are too lengthy to list. But um, that's kind of how I was looking at it. Now, this can be scrambled up in whatever way you want. And so these are some of the numbers. Some of the numbers are valid. The, the City Hall ventilation project, that's a factual number. That's what's needed if we want to do that project. But if you look at the rest of them, they could all be moved. There is no magic number of $1 million for a parking project or 600000 for overlays. We can move that <coughs> around. But I wanted to put some meaningful numbers in there so that as we move forward, those are probably likely numbers that we'd want to see in that category of number in order to make it worthwhile to do, say, additional mill and overlay projects, et cetera. So, any questions on that part? Councilman Emerson. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, yeah, Mr. Trout, I, I guess I had a question, and I, I saw down in the, the spreadsheet that's underneath a mention, and I, I, think this is, I, well, I think this is maybe from utilities about the line relocations and stuff for the uh, Quincy Viaduct. Right. And I take it there's also going to be a lot of other costs the city's going to have in that project. I don't know that. But... The, the uh, utilities amounts are not going to count towards our $20 million commitment that we have. And so that's why we we're looking at those here. A lot of the other issues related to mill and overlay to prepare roads when there are detours and so forth will be, over, be covered by the $20 million. Um, so this is kind of trying to take a look at the utility needs that we have that aren't to be expected to be covered by our geo bonding of $20 million. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Other comments or questions? Councilman Duncan. Um, there's a comment in the notes that we have. Well, actually, let me start with the other. Uh, on the infrastructure projects, the lead service line removal is a, I won't say a generic number, but it's an even $5 million. The other seems somewhat specific. Do we already know what those specific projects are? Or are we just saying, give us that money, and then we'll tell you what those projects are? The kind of both, and the way I say that is, we believe that those are numbers that I picked to try and make sure we're distributing a, a good chunk of the money that we have available, the 45 million, towards fixing waters, towards fixing sewer and storm sewer issues. One of the things that will be done at the next meeting, and I have a meeting with Director Copley, is to actually give you specific program locations where we would do certain projects. Now, I can only do that to a certain extent because at this point I don't have the exact numbers for what we're going to need for the bulk quincy utilities. Bulk quincy utilities numbers right now are being created, expected to be maybe available in December. And so we're creating, but my intent is to give you a specific project list for water, sewer, storm sewer projects. On the uh, lead line issue, we are already in the process of identifying which locations have lead service lines believe actually that the five million might not be enough to cover every location that we have in our community but it would make a dent in it the issue that we're waiting for is the current bill that's in congress is supposed to also have money in there available for lead line and if we're able to get to the point where that gets a decision made and we can figure out how that's going to be allocated we may have money to do lead lines in that pot of money and not need to utilize this pot of money 
And so that's, that's the intent with regards to it. But I realize that, and that's part of the reason infrastructure committee's there, is to give you more specifics on how that funding would be used. But uh, Director Copley already has a good list of where we would actually spend that, and we would create and give you that full list. It's mentioned, some of the items are mentioned in the notes, just to give you an idea for where some of those locations would be, but a specific program list is not. Uh, but we're looking to do that and bring that to you at the next meeting. Well, and I understand there might have to be some wiggle room one way or the other to some degree. I guess I'm going to feel a lot more comfortable if we have at least some targeted list because I think in the long term that's the only way we're going to be guaranteed that that money actually gets spent on those very specific projects that we've prioritized as needing done now, yep. which is the purpose of using this money on those critical uh-oh, we better deal with them right now situations. Yeah. And so, which leads to my next question is, I, I, the notes here say that after this is approved, it will then have to be incorporated into the CIP budget. I guess my general question is, why would we inc include this as part of the CIP? And the reason I ask that is, I view this money as, as in, in its own box. It is not intended to, as we say, plug holes. Yeah, there are a few programs that three or four years from now, we might have to figure out where some funding comes from, and that does give me slight heartburn, but some of those programs are absolutely essential, and I can ride that wave a little bit more. But my concern is, if we put these in the CIP, instead of designating specifically, it's this dollars for these projects, it's its own separate thing, that we then run the risk of what can sometimes happen, as we've learned with the CIP, is those dollars get put in, and then we're told later, well, it was in the CIP, and yeah, we might have moved it around, and we've wiggled it because we need it over here now, and suddenly the project we wanted to get funded doesn't get funded. And I, I'm just not sure. sure. I'd like to have that conversation about why we, why we wouldn't just keep it as its own thing. The reason is for budgeting purposes. We have to allocate money um, from where it's going to be spent. So there has to be some uh, ledger entries as it comes to the budget. And so if we put them in the CIP, they would be listed under cash, cash projects funded by grants. And that's how we would list them in the budget in the CIP. So it would be specific to the types of projects and they would be listed under cash under the CIP. So that you would not lose them into the general overall structure. They would be specific, specific projects listed in the CIP funded by cash with the source being the grant funding that we receive from ARPA. And it's simply we have to make those ledger entries in order for me to be able to, for us, the city, to be able to spend the money appropriately um, rather than have it be out there and not accounted for at any point related to the budget. Well, because that would be my next question. What I would be worried about is in 2024, we miss one of those. We make a change to the CIP, and then we've, we've put that level of funding in some sort of risk because we designated it in 2021, as the feds told us to do. We suddenly accidentally spent this. So, so that's my concern. I, I think the cleanest way we can do this, the better to, to not to mix as little as possible with those with those things. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilwoman Hiller. Well, I would I would reply to that one, having been here when we as a body said everything that we do that is a big project ought to be in the CIP, whether we're bonding it or spending cash or we have outside sources so that we always every year we're looking at the whole picture. I would suggest that beyond what the city manager said, even under the cash, it can have its own. We have federal, you know, whatever it is, the federal money that's the for bridges and certain projects, and they get their own set of line items. We have it for the um, for the half cent sales tax for the county and for the city. And the county one, for instance, is voted on by the citizens actually, and. We may move around a little bit, but those projects were, were part of it. And so we know we're locked on those. With, with each source, there might be different flexibility or not. But that really helps us as a body always see the whole picture. I agree that they should be, they should be clearly identified. But um, just, just for a little background on why, I mean, it used to be that, that anything that was funded with cash didn't show up there either. But for us to be looking at what sources and being being as, as responsible as possible about how we did things, it seemed to work out best to be seeing the whole thing, not just part of it um, for, for what that's worth. Um, I, if I could make a comment too, I, I really appreciate the mayor's comment about long-term impact. 
I think every single item on this should be what I call a strategic investment. Um, it's the outcomes that, that Council, Councilman Dobler talked about, but you know, what are we going to get for it? Come on, come on, I saw that. Um, and uh, anyway, I, I really appreciate both of those comments because I think we really can get multiplier effect out of all of these, and we, and we should. Along those lines, um, and another reason I think it should be in the CIP, I suppose, is what was your thought about whether these utility ones, the ones you've already mentioned and the ones that are coming up here, would be in addition to what we had in the CIP, or would they offset the revenue bond expenses that we anticipated, let's say, when we passed the last one, or part and part? The likelihood is that all of these projects would eventually come to you as a revenue bond need. So what we would be doing is paying for them with this funding rather than issuing bonds for them. And so it might be that some of these projects would not be done for four, five, six years from now. It would allow us the ability to do them now with cash. And the intent would be not to um, need to sell as much in the way of revenue bonds in the coming years in order to be able to do them. These are some of them projects that are listed, our targeted projects already on the list that need to be done. And so we would be able to, should be able to reduce how much we need to sell in the way of revenue bonds over the next few years where we're doing this back, this funding. Thank you. These projects. I, I certainly approve of that, even in terms of on the geo bonds, if we're needing to make room to borrow for whole Quincy, working as smart as we can through all of it. Thank you. Yeah, just a quick comment. I don't know what format this ultimately takes for approval, but I think we should um, request that all these projects, come, the project budgets, come to the council for approval um, that are being funded by ARPA money. Allows us a better budget. opportunity to keep track of it. Thank you. Did it matter? Okay, so the next segment is page 14, which is premium pay for essential workers. Um, under that, you see 1.5 million that's already been allocated for police officers and firefighters. That's already been negotiated. Um, move to the next slide. There you go. And I plugged in 600,000. There's been some discussion by the governing body about other city employees that were related to um, having to be interact with the public and so forth during that time frame and that there's a desire to see them receive some pay in this type of an area. So right now that is a figure that would allow us some flexibility to do that if the governing body were to desire to do so. Okay. So the last page, which is 16, which um, is back to the water and sewer infrastructure, which is where most of the money would be spent. Um, this is an allocation close to 30 million. Uh, and the other thing that I'll mention is because of the changes that I made in MAP and also in um, the co-responders program, there's actually 350,000 that would be added back into the sewer infrastructure repairs line. And so what I did basically, you can probably tell, is that I did the social programs with the amount that I think is necessary and then whatever was left over was put into doing these utility type projects. That's where we get our biggest bang for the buck and our ability to make a lasting impact is by being able to not have to borrow as much for some of these projects and move this forward um, within the community. Now um, I can tell you that we have way more projects than this that could be funded with this money. We know what our, what our CIP budget looks like. But this is, these are the numbers that I have right now, and we can certainly move these around based on the projects that we might say are available that we would want to pursue. Broadband infrastructure, I really looked at um, on, on 17. That is um, a difficult one for us, and that we don't have a need specifically for any type of built infrastructure when it comes to broadband. 
we're in a position that we have private providers that provide most of that inf already. And right now, at this point, I haven't been presented a project that needs to have a built infrastructure added to our system. Um, we supported the broadband literacy earlier, but actual built project we don't have. And so I'll stop there and answer any more questions you might have. Councilwoman. I have one more overall question, and I should probably know the answer to this, so sorry if I, if right. I should. Last time we got a big lump sum through COVID money, the county got one as well, and the county gave us part, uh, because we're part right. of the county, we got part of that. About 8.9 million. So is there any discussion of that this time? Um, there is roughly, if I remember correctly, about 2.5 million of that that has not been utilized. And so that is uh, available and can be utilized in any way we would desire. Um, I have not included any of that in this funding. This is all just ARPA funding. So I have to go back and look at where we're, um, might be additional funds available for that. Okay, so what you're saying is we still have 2.5 million of the allocation that we got be before? Yeah, Steve's shaking his head yes. Okay. Right and around 2.5 million. But are they still. getting an ARPA allocation like ours? Mm -hmm. Yes, they have their own allocation. And so are we getting a percentage no. of that? No. no. This, because we were a entitlement city, we received our own specific allocation, okay. did not have to go through the county or the state this time, came directly, comes directly to us. And as I mentioned, we've received our first 22.2 million and we'll receive the other 22.3 or 4 million uh, next year at some point. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah. and then. That funding has been, that, those funds have been invested and are drawing interest. And then any, one nice thing that's with the way they wrote this is any interest gained off of the money that we have in the bank um, uh, can be utilized for projects. So if we have, the, the number may be much larger, may be larger than 45.6 million that we have available based on whatever interest we gain over the next few years. But that's not calculated in here. And could you just clarify as a reminder to us and to the public, though, that money has a different timeline yes. than this money. So Right. CARES Act money is basically already been expensed and so has no due date that we have to spend it by. Um, this money has a date that has to be encumbered or allocated by December 31 of 2024 and spent by December 31 of 2026. And then we have some additional funding we received. Um, that uh, has other due dates, but they're all 22, 2022 or 2023 in timeline, and we're tracking those. Appreciate the question. At this point, I would like to call the public yeah. to make their remarks. I still do not see Jonathan Sublette. Um, actually, he's on Zoom. Jonathan, are you available? Yes, Madam Mayor, I am available. The floor is yours. Four minutes. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor, uh, for this opportunity and to the rest of the council. In the book of First Corinthians, in the 12th chapter, the Apostle Paul says that often um, some of the most valuable parts of the body go unnoticed, unhonored, and, and their value is unrecognized. And I know that's the case with um, people who serve in such positions as yours. A lot of times, the commitment you make, the time you serve, all the meetings and everything else, go unnoticed and un, um, just honored uh, within our city. In the same way, I think the infrastructure of our city gets the same treatment. Um, our infrastructure allows us to continue living the life that we live in, loving the city of Topeka and our neighborhood. But often, it's not noticed until something goes wrong with it. But it's very valuable. Tonight, I'm here to speak on behalf of the Highcrest neighborhood and ask for funding from these ARPA funds to be invested in the infrastructure of the Highcrest neighborhood. I believe that this investment will continue to allow us to take our next step as a neighborhood. Um, over the years, since the city of Topeka uh, began doing neighborhood health mapping, the west side of Highcrest was always an intensive care neighborhood, the very lowest rating. After three and a half years of investment with other organizations within the community, we were able to take uh, our first step and became an at-risk neighborhood um, this year as a part of that rating. I believe that we were able to get these funds 
that it would allow us to continue the economic development that's taking place in our neighborhood and take our next step. I also realized that as uh, city manager, um, Mr. Trout made his presentation, there's a lot of worthy places for these funds to go. And that there's a lot of organizations that are doing great work within our city. And it's a hard decision. And so I want to let you know that more than I want you to fund infrastructure needs for high press, I want you to make the healthiest decision long term for the city of Topeka, which I know is always on your heart. Because more than being a resident of Highcrest, I'm a resident of Topeka. And my long-term goal, I'm one of the inaugural members of the um, Kansas Future Fellows Program, which is a partnership between the University of Kansas Center for Public and Private Partnership and the state of Kansas. And my 20-year goal is to see at-risk and intensive care neighborhoods eradicated from the city of Topeka. And I'm partnering with people from around the state and other organizations to see that come about. And so more than the short-term win of funding um, some of these projects in, in my neighborhood, I would want to see the best decision made long-term. Now that I believe, and we're willing to do economic impact analysis to show how those infrastructure projects would bring a return to the city and all residents. And so if those, fund, those projects were to get funded, um, it would not be an end in itself in just high press. But my commitment would be to my 20 year goal, which is to help all at risk and intensive care neighborhoods so that there's only blue on that map and no longer any red. And so I hope that you consider this consideration as you make um, your decisions around these ARPA funds. But I want to let you know this. Whatever your decision may be, I'm a resident of Topeka and you are my leaders. Um, I'll submit to your will. I'll support you. Um, as we go forward, and I appreciate your service to our community. Thank you so much, Jonathan. The next person signed up to speak is Matt Savala. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. We have a unique opportunity right now with these ARPA funds, and, and I agree with Jonathan that uh, one of the best places for the city to see a return on investment is in some of the most underserved areas of the community, specifically within Highcrest and East Topeka. Right now, there are businesses, individuals, and organizations supporting improvement in that area. To the tune of over a million dollars, if the city is willing to invest in that area, there are others that will help additional development happen in that area. Um, we had a small coalition of individuals who um, said that they would be willing to show up and show their support for, for what's happening in those areas as far as um, adding homes, um, rebuilding homes, um, continuing education for the young people in those areas, and, and making sure everybody has the best foundation. Um, we didn't have those people come present to the meeting tonight because our understanding was that um, it all needed to be done virtually. I understand now that that may not be um, the reality, but there is a large group of people, businesses, and organizations in the area that are behind this, in, this initiative that we're asking um, the city to consider funding. And um, we believe that it will be a long-term investment for the city to add um, homes that could be developed after those infrastructure improvements were made, and it would add tax dollars to the tax roll. Um, we have started an, an independent economic impact analysis through Impact Data Source. Um, they are one of the largest um, providers of those, of those um, economic impact analysis. Uh, we can show that over the course of the next five years, there is a direct economic impact to the city of Topeka. Um, of about 50 million dollars that would be taxable um, in addition to um, what would be added to the tax roll for new homes being built. But um, a small investment from the city will go a long way um, in returning that investment to the city several times over. So we believe it's a smart decision. It's not every day that a, a small contribution by the city can make a huge impact like that in returning that investment. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Mr. Joseph Ledbetter. Well, 
thank you, board and governing body, and uh, I certainly would always stand up for Highcrest. I was president of there five years, uh, a few years ago, and so I was thinking what needs done over Highcrest that didn't get done while I was president. Uh, the streets on the west side of Adams, we did not get mill and overlay. We got them east, and we brought those projects down here to City Hall, and they actually voted on them. You, the uh, governing body, those of you who were, who were here. And I thought, now, where could I take that money? So I was looking at the numbers. Uh, 3.3 million for uh, City Hall ventilation. I'd rather put that into streets, and I could serve a whole lot more people. So uh, there's an idea. Um, I would like to see a lot more of this money considered for housing incentives. Uh, we need to start growing this city again. Uh, we need uh, to get people to want to build here. Uh, yes, I have no problem, and I said this uh, in some of my emails I just sent, uh, putting a little of this money into code enforcement, but uh, I wouldn't hire two full-time people. Uh, I think we do much better to start hiring part-time people. There's a lot of retired people who would take those jobs. Uh, we wouldn't have to pay the extra benefits. There's a lot of ideas that you can do with code enforcement, and I've been sending them to you all, uh, that uh, would make it a lot more effective. So I won't go into those details right now. But I have no, my, uh, no problem with some of this money being spent on some of those ideas. Uh, I am concerned about the utility projects. I want to see them broken down with specificity. I don't want more craters in Gage Park. Uh, I want to know that the council actually saw these projects ahead of time and approved them. Uh, I, I'm a little befuddled by the CIP. I, I don't remember seeing the CIP projects for uh, TPAC either, but uh, I would, I'm not opposed to TPAC, but I would like to see a breakdown of that $2 million that's proposed for capital projects. What are you spending it on? And that is a city-owned building, so let's, let's all be clear with that. And let's break out with transparency where all this money is going. And let's have council approval on this. Um, I'd be much more comfortable with the governing body and this board voting on all of this uh, than just carte blanche saying, well, here's a wish list. This is what we came up with. We had your input, but three years from now, that's all forgotten because it was not solidified by ordinance, by resolution, whatever is needed, okay? I like, I like things being in writing and expressed with detail. So uh, when we do bring the uh, utility director back up here, I want to see lots of detail from him about what he's proposing and a timeline. And uh, I want to make sure that this money is uh, going into those projects and not just replacing what's already been spent or going to be spent uh, and borrowed with revenue bonds. Uh, I won't go there tonight. I've already said my spiel about revenue bonds and how out of control I think it is. Um, there's a lot of smaller things that I could talk about. I won't. I'm going to run out of time. Uh, I will send further emails about uh, where I think some of this money could be spent and where I hear people telling me they want this money spent, but this is, uh, this is money that needs, as some have said, to be strategically spent so that it has a lasting, a lasting positive impact on the community and that we can actually see it years from now and uh, not wonder what black hole it went down or where it went. So uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Any closing comments, city manager? Again, no, this is an open discussion, so. No, just if you have comments, uh, questions, thoughts, um, please send them or schedule a meeting and we can go talk through these in more detail. Um, this is brought before you in order for you to be able to make these decisions. This is definitely a, a decision that needs to be made by you. This is, as mentioned, game-changing allocation of funds, and it's available for you to make the decisions and drive things for it. Councilman Dobler. Thank you. Just a quick comment. I appreciate uh, the comments from Mr. Sablet, Mr. Sabala. Um, you know, we have two items on there, mill and overlay projects and curb and gutter projects, about 1.1 million. And I, I can support that, I guess, but, 
We also have a sales tax that generates 14 plus million a year for, the, for similar projects. Um, and I think it would make sense to designate for the ARPA money that's spent on those type of projects to designate intensive care and at-risk neighborhoods. Um, that's my comment. Thanks. Thanks. Tend to agree. <laughs> All right. This discussion is not over at this point in time. I think that all of us are going to put our thinking caps on and pull out our calculators and start having conversations of what's the wisest and most sustainable investments with this platform that has been provided to us. So thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we now move on to the public comment. The first person signed up to speak is Michael Ganey. Michael Ganey, Ms. Lassiter. Good evening, Mayor, City Council. Glad to be here this evening. I have a one, two, three, as I normally do, and that is my goodness, what, when, how, and that's because I'm concerned about the 12th Street project. It just leaves some of us in bewilderment because I was firstly at a meeting and we had several seniors, elders, veterans, taxpayers, and citizens from the Tennessee Town, Westboro area that were so concerned about this project because they couldn't get out of their driveways. They were literally begging, crying for the city planners not to do this street in this manner. Now, so now we're on a when. What is the timeline when it'll be finished? I don't consider myself to be an engineer by any means. However, I've spoken to a number of them and they've said that this project could have been handled in a different manner, and that is from Kansas Avenue to some of our uh, presidential streets, Tyler Polk, Taylor, Lincoln, B uh, Buchanan, that it, they could be repaired from that area to this area because those are arteries in the middle of the city, and then at another time, or continue with Buchanan, Lincoln, Woodward, uh, Boswell on to Gage. We haven't seen that. It's just as if the, the whole thing was shut down from Kansas Avenue to Plaz, and you have people that literally are come, trying to come through Burlingame and so forth, and they have to go all the way to Fairlawn or Gage to 10th Street just to get to the center of the city. The other piece of this is that, of course, the Tennessee town area, which I'm in, it feels like a major attack, a second major attack against the center of the city. And I'm not a person who gripe. I'm always about building. I believe we're the heart of God. We're the center of the U.S. of A. But the super, super grocery store was closed down in that area. So the other solution I hear is either OT or power. The reason that this happened is either OT or power. And that's by the time we get to the winter, somebody's going to get paid for overtime to get it fixed rapidly. Or somebody with authority is going to say, we had the power to shut it down. We didn't have to hear the people. And once again, I believe sometime the voice of the people is the voice of God. So we want to see this, some resolve to the 12th Street project, which many of our citizens did not agree. And thank you very much. Bless you. Goodbye. Thank you for your comments. <laughs> Teresa. I have some handouts. Is that OK? I can hand them to you. The reason why I'm handing these out is because I want you to take them home. I want you to look through this. This can happen to your district, not just what happened to mine. This will happen to yours. And I'm trying to stop it. So please don't pay attention. But I left one of the major important things that I'm going to ask you to write it down on a certain Thank page. You. I am talking about a property that is actually listed in the North Topeka West NIA. Uh, it original address was 2007 Northwest Taylor. 
It was purchased by a gentleman, Monopoly LLC, and they came in and they want to build three more houses on the property. No problem. The neighborhood was not notified whatsoever what was going on. And to me, I would think, if you're gonna use one certain address, you should have uh, the zoning change to multi-dwelling. But according to them, they, someone went in and changed it to another address on top of the 2000, the 2007. Now we have 2009. Don't know where the other numbers went, but that's what we have. So it was very, very hard to find any information on this. I had to have somebody search for me because I was, I had no luck dealing with certain people in the city. On the page there where I have it listed one through five right after the, the front page, one thing I need you to write down and I want you to remember this, 100 year flood plan. That is the culprit that's causing the major problem. 100 year flood plan. Haven't heard of it, don't know why. Something to do with the Corps of Engineers. Our city utilities uh, person, and I'm just gonna call everybody knows who Braxton is. I'm just gonna call him by his first name, Braxton. I called him and I asked him, why do we have, because here's what, you, just imagine, the neighbors didn't know what was going on in their neighborhood. They wake up and they got this Olympic size pit in their next, next door, up to their properties. It is right on the property lines, on two people's property lines. This big old thing, it's Olympic size, and it's S-shaped. It's right up to the foundation of the home that's already established on this property. They were told that that's what they had to do because they're in the 100-year flood plain. And I'm going, what? No. So I've had a lot of people panicking, calling me, and uh, so I said, I am not president of the NIA anymore, but I will handle this because I live a block from this. There's no drainage to it. It's gonna be just like Myers Pond, we call it, on Lyman Road, which has a draining tube, but it never drains. But this water's gonna start building up every time it rains, and because the level they have it, it's gonna be pouring from a lot of properties. Why it's there, because there's really not enough land to build the other three houses that he's putting on them. One of, they're really small, and we're trying to figure out where the parking, if any type of parking to this thing's gonna be. There's no, no hardly any plans or anything you can't pull up. I did have somebody pull me up, a, and it's in here, the residential building permit application, which had a few drawings with it. Um, also, the little green thing that's on the, the, probably about the third or fourth page in, that little green area on that uh, uh, map, I can't even pronounce it, but the addition, that is the, what I call the swamp. That is how big that pit is that's gonna hold water. That's almost as much as what the houses are that's on it. So, and then right as you walk out where they gotta plan these houses, you walk right out and you're right in it. I mean, and it, it's, it's crazy. So I'm trying to figure out how we ended up with this. How can we get rid of this big giant pit? Because on two sides of there, butted up to one of them is a daycare. Across the street is a daycare. Less than 300 feet is a school. You know how dangerous it is? Because when people ask this guy, are you gonna put a fence around this? He uses some choice words and will not answer. So I'm trying to figure out how can we stop. Can Teresa, I do you need an extension of time? I need just a little bit more time. Two minutes? Hmm? Two minutes? That's fine. Councilwoman uh, Hiller votes for uh, motions for second. two minutes. We have a second by Councilwoman Valdivia Alcala. We proceed by voting. All those who are not in favor, please express. Having nobody uh, in a position Everybody approves, it's unanimous. Teresa, you have your two minutes. Okay, are we ready? Okay. Uh, so I wanna draw this to attention to all of you because this can happen to every one of your districts. That's just not mine. We have no problem with any type of flooding because I don't pay flood insurance or anything because, and I'm closer to the creek than this property is, but I'm not understanding why he's making people that are building things now, build these monstrosity ditches and is do, I'm not the only one, there has been one other one that I think has been brought up in front of you before not too long ago, 
But the neighbors had no clue. They were not notified. This just, here you go, this is what you do. And they ask any questions, they can't get any answers. And so I filled this packet, I gave you pictures. Pictures don't do it justice. Please drive by 2007 Northwest Taylor to see this. The pictures do not do it justice. When you see this giant hole, you're gonna be, oh my God, how would, did we allow this to happen? So I need to help, have you help me fill this hole in and make it stop that we don't do this in anybody else's neighborhood. So uh, that's why I've made such a big packet and given you so many pictures and give you so much information because this does not ever need to happen again. And hopefully we can get that hole filled in for the neighbors. The neighbors have no problem with the building of the of houses there. It's the big hole because it's right up on the property line, right to the back. There's a gate on one person's property. He opens up the gate and he falls right in the hole. You know, and it's right along the fence line of the daycare and it's right on their driveway, right by their back door where the children can run out and fall into that. So it, it's dangerous, it's scary, and I hope that you guys can help me get this fixed and help me make sure it doesn't ever happen to any more of your districts. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Councilwoman Valeria Alcala. Hold on just a moment, Teresa. Uh, this is the first I've heard about this, and like mm -hmm. you said, you're handling it rather than you know notifying the uh, historic North Topeka West NIA. I'll be in contact with you about it. Again, this is the first I've heard about it, and so I'm going to look over this tonight, right. and I'll be in contact with you, and then we will go from there. Right. You were busy doing some of the other stuff the other day, and I knew the, the night that I was there when you were talking, but I, I, my arthritis was bothering me, so I left. But I had to stay on this, and it took me up to yesterday to get any information on this whatsoever. Right. So, and it was like pulling eye teeth to try to even get it. It was right. like it was secret. It's, it, I'm going, like, why is this such a secret? So, and I've never had, in all the 15 years I've been a, an NIA president, ever had trouble finding any information on any property or any project. Well, I'll I would like to leave one you. for Ortiz. Yes, thank so you. So who do I give it to? Uh, leave it with the clerk, and okay. they'll make sure that she right. will receive thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you. The final person is Mr. Ledbetter. Board, governing body, uh, Joseph Ledbetter. What Teresa's telling you is absolutely, you've got to drive by it yourself. You cannot believe this pit in this residential area that just got dug. <clears throat> so, uh, You'll laugh, but if you lived there, you'd be crying. It's, it's ridiculous. I want to uh, make sure that I hand out something into the record. Uh, if you'll pass these around, please. I know that uh, these uh, letters were sent by email, but I want to make sure there's one in the record. Uh, this is a letter to Edgar I wrote uh, five years ago about code problems. Uh, and at that time, I had joined forces with uh, momentum and other people that uh, the, the partnership that wanted to help clean the city up and this was a number one concern raised by citizens that in streets was that we needed uh, a better appearing city we needed uh, things fixed and uh, we know the rest of the story I'm not going to go there tonight you've seen lots of my emails you've seen uh, you've heard my testimony uh, here and other places including that memorable night I talked about rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. Anyway, okay. I thought it was funny at the time, but <clears throat> we, we just never seem to solve this problem. So I'm not going to berate it tonight and go over it over and over. Um, I want to jump back real quick to the ARPA money. Uh, Neil actually mentioned this, and I, I actually like the idea. I would like to see any of the street money uh, put into at-risk and intensive care neighborhoods. Uh, and one of the experiences I had was when I was lobbying for that, those streets over in Highcrest, I think we got like 13 million uh, over oh, about a four-year period of time. And some of the people in council are still here that, that helped vote, vote for that, and I appreciate it. But the last year I was president over there, I got off in 18, 
And the valuations came in uh, from that work with the next appraisal cycle, and Highcrest uh, had jumped in valuation 9%. So this does work. Now, we had really good uh, attention with code enforcement for a couple of years over there because I just insisted that things be clean. And I had the help of different people with the city. But the point I'm making is that, com that combined effort of improving the infrastructure, uh, Fremont Hill, which was uh, a disaster, and redoing it, and, and some park improvements we got. We had, a, we had a number of things come together, but it had lasting value. And, and the, va the valuations continue to go up over there. Uh, so uh, a lot of people are surprised. I said, I'm not. I said, that'll be the last thing that happens once we do the other steps is we'll get private investment start to start coming in. Some of it's nonprofits, but a lot of it's just private investors buying over there. And uh, fortunately, at least the ones I've seen are, are cleaning them up and making them better properties. So uh, yeah, it's a one, once in a lifetime, well, once in a several decades time to get this extra money. But uh, it can be put to use in a way that it will have lasting positive uh, results. So uh, that's all I have. Uh, thank you very much for bearing with me. Thank you, Mr. Ledbetter. At this point in time, we move on to the announcements. And um, city manager, we start with you. I have nothing, Mayor. City Clerk. For the October 12th agenda, we have two presentations, the Public Works Quarterly Report and the Utilities Quarterly Report. Consent agenda are routine items. Action items, there's an ordinance for fair van scooters located at 1409 Northwest Topeka Boulevard. Second action item is an ordinance, Brian Thompson, for location of Southeast 10th Street, east of Southeast Wittenberg Road. Item C is a resolution of advisability and authorization, Horseshoe Bend subdivisions number six and number seven, a sanitary sewer improvement project. Item D is a resolution of advisability and authorization of Horseshoe Bend subdivisions number Six and number seven, street improvement project. Item E is a public hearing and ordinance for neighborhood revitalization plan renewal 2022 to 2024. And item F is a resolution for downtown parking meters, 100 blocks of Kansas Avenue. And that are all. That, those are all the items on the agenda. Um, Braxton, before I make my remark. Um, are we clear to celebrate the video that were that were the the, the the word that the city just received with regards to the biogas pro, uh, project? I think we are, and if we're not, now we are. <laughs> we we have been we have been nominated, but we have not been provided with final word that we have done the award the night of the 19th is the award ceremony so I will not be able to attend the this ceremony but I'm fairly confident when they asked for videos from the mayor and from the yeah. city manager for an acceptance speech I think that we're probably um, a shoe in so just so that everybody knows the, the the award that we're talking about is the they're called the energy vision award is a national award and the city of Topeka is being considered because of their biogas project. Um, so we don't know if we got it, but um, I want to just, you know, yet again, before we even go into that award ceremony, knowing whether we're going to get the award or not, it's pretty cool that our city is being looked at as a leader in the environmental area. Um, that's been something that we've talked about that matters, um, and for us to be able to just be recognized as a mid-sized city doing something really big, it's kind of cool, guys. So that's the announcement I have, Deputy Mayor. Councilman Dobler. 
Councilman Duncan. Two very quick things. First is, I would never take smoke detectors away from Councilmember Ortiz, but as she reminded everyone, my wall-to-wall -wall smoke detectors at home. I also like to remind people, carbon monoxide detectors are also very important if you need them in your house. Of course, I once lived in an apartment where I went and bought one because I thought I needed it until I realized there was no gas in my house, but I was very well protected at that time. But to those people who do have gas in their homes and need it, please make sure you're covered there. Uh, my second thing is, and I guess this is a request to staff, um, how they want to do this would be fine, but you may have seen in the news recently that our good friends in Pottawatomie County were cyber attacked. And in the last year and a half since I got on the council, I've occasionally sent messages to staff saying, hey, are we covered for this as I read those in the news? And usually their answers are great and we seem to be well covered. But it would be really great if we could put something together for us as a body that you know, and at some point in the next month or so or month and a half a presentation so the public knows what we're doing. Um, and then that may lead to some questions because I saw, for instance, in their case, they end up having to buy some new software to encrypt things so that the next time it happens, they're protected. And so you, you, can't, uh, you can't solve every problem, but it would be nice to get an update on kind of where we are as a city, what, what we're covered for and insurance and all that exciting stuff. So if we could do that at some point in the future, yeah. that would be wonderful. So thank you, Mayor. Councilman Duncan, you have me clenching my pearls after what you just did to Councilwoman Ortiz, but hey, we'll get there. <laughs> Councilman Lesser? No, I, I would second that. Um, in my industry, we're seeing tons and tons and tons of cyber security issues, and, and, and uh, I think the mayor and I actually um, were, were um, a year or so ago when we, we, we uh, did the directive to move it to where we had more than just one, one data storage site. So. Um, see that all the time so I think it's a good time to to look at that as well as the different FISing protections we have in regards to our, our transfers and stuff like that so that's a good idea Spencer Thanks. Councilwoman Hiller thank you mayor just a couple quick things one um, I kind of regret not jumping in after mrs. Lassiter made her remarks um, if I could request that there be a public um, education piece about just what the status is of the 12th Street project and what the ex expectations should be in terms of <clears throat> I know that people thought at first that it was going to be done in sort of dominoes and that it would be torn up at a certain like between K Adams and Kansas and then that would be underway and they they'd start working from I'm sorry Adams to Topeka then Topeka to Western roughly, then Western to Washburn, and then on West, with the idea that by the time they started pushing West, this other would be open. And that hasn't happened, and now what you get, I, I ended up in the middle of all of it, not only because I live there and everybody's running around like mice in a maze, but the Aaron Douglas Art Fair had assumed that, that 12th and Lane would be open by the official announcements back in May. And they managed to have a, a really tremendous fair locked in the corner on 12th Street with a big construction pile next to them. But um, I know there were some problems with rain. And then there was a, there's a fitting that I guess needed to be under the intersection at 12th and Western that didn't come. And so it was tough to go past it. But if, um, if there's any confidence of how things should move at this point, it would be really helpful to, um, to know if, it's, if anything's going to be open before Thanksgiving, which is kind of the stock reply has been Thanksgiving. <laughs> City Manager. We have the Public Works quarterly report on the agenda for the next meeting, so we'll just expand that a little bit and provide some additional background on where we're at on the 12th Street project. Thank you, and, and, and if correspondingly with that, I, I realize you don't want to overpromise, especially at this point, but if the public could, could right. have an advisory, it would be helpful. Yeah, there have been a number of issues related to utility items and other holdups that we've had, and so we'll, we'll outline those and give you some expectations as to what will be happening going forward. Thank you, thank you. Um, also, just a quick advertisement for everyone. I went ahead and offered to carry the banner at the front of the St. Patrick's Day Parade. And that was kind of an off-season deal, and no one else was available. So I just wanted you to know that I took some scraps at home and made a strap for it. And it was, <laughs> it's very easy for one person to carry it. It's a little longer than our old banner, so actually it needs to carry up a little higher. 
Um, the way Liz got it arranged, the, the pole that it's on comes with the banner. It's very, very light. So whether you need to put something on a wall at an event or have a walking parade or something like that, I just, Liz is keeping it on the wall in the back room in the council office, but it is, it's very portable and um, very easy to manage. So FYI, because I think that was its maiden voyage with COVID. It's been hanging on the wall for a long time, but it was his first time out. So, um, and last but not least, you'll be hearing more, but I just want to thank everyone um, for what you did to promote the series of seven public input sessions that the Public Health and Safety Committee did and attending when you could. We had phenomenal attendance. We had phenomenal participation. We did the full two hours, as far as I know, on every single one. I, w I missed only the last one, so I'm looking for, but it sounded like it was full as well. And really um, what we'd hoped for, which was that the public could give us ideas on solutions and strategies that we hadn't thought of happened every time. Um, and we'll, we'll save the details for, um, for when we've met, but it was really impressive, really rich. Um, thank the staff for all the assistance that they provided as well. Our, our next public health and safety meeting is the 13th of October, and as soon as the very last session from last week is posted, we will task ourselves with trying to sort through all the data. You all are welcome to look at those results as well. They have been progressively posted as we've added notes to the web page that the staff added to the website. So um, further ideas, we were encouraging people to turn in any, any thoughts that they had by the 30th of September. But, uh, and there is a portal still open on the website, but if people have other thoughts yourselves or have somebody that says, oh yeah, I meant to go, Send them in. Thank you. Councilwoman Valdivia Alcala. Thank you, Mayor. Just a couple of things uh, to piggyback off of uh, what Karen was talking about. Uh, September was a really intense month, but I think the months to come are going to be even more intense with dissemination, you know, just taking, picking apart the information, trying to grab on to what may work. We have to think outside of the box in this. We have to, you know, help communities feel like we're in partnership with them, a real partnership with them. And there is just so much information. I don't know, somehow I thought October, November, December was gonna be more low key, but I told Karen it's probably not now as <laughs> we go over pages and pages of data, but you know, it'll be worth it in the long run. Uh, the other thing is, is that the Oakland Community Garden had their, uh, closing of the garden we're still doing a little bit of harvesting but we're not having any having any visitors or anything of that nature we closed it down and we're just doing what's left over uh, for this season uh, amongst ourselves we had a potluck dinner and patted ourselves on the back that with a core of about seven to eight we were able to do so much and there were some really really hard times involved in it but we pushed out a lot of produce and we're already planning for next year. So we're very, very excited about that. And also just wanted to wish my one and only brother-in-law, Sluggo, a happy birthday today. Not gonna say how old he is because he gave me $20 not to say it in public. I'm just joking, Slug. But uh, anyway, just wanted to wish him a happy birthday. Thank you, Mayor. Councilman Emerson. Oh, Councilman Ortiz. <laughs> I think it was a peace out. Was that a peace out? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so, uh, thank you, Mayor, unless I uh, see uh, Councilwoman. Yeah, no, we can't see her on um, the screen, so we don't know if yeah. there's comments that she wants to make. Oh. Councilwoman, was that a pass? That was a pass. Councilman Emerson. Okay, just, just very quickly, I um, want to thank Councilman Emerson over here, excuse me, Lesser. Uh, as well as a code enforcement, Mike Haugen, uh, John Chardine, and uh, our Topeka police. Uh, they met us out at a, a homeless camp, would have been a homeless camp in my district last week. And um, they, were, they were great. They were able to uh, get the people to, to move, uh, hopefully to a suitable housing that they'll, they'll stay at. But uh, the guys went in there later on that day and uh, from the city and, and made a pile of things. And, and, 
Uh, we're getting Green Touch to donate the, the dumping fees. Green Point, thank you. To donate the dumping fees. So uh, I, it, was, it was a great win for Topeka. And, uh, and just, just while I'm on it, uh, you know, one of the things that they've really been struggling with in the property maintenance is lack of staff right now. And I'm sure most of us saw in the Capital Journal this week, it's a chronic thing, in, especially in, in Kansas right now. It's, I am just have the story up now, you know, 4.7 drop in the number of public sector workers in the state, you know, 12,000 jobs. Uh, Lawrence has, uh, Lawrence is doing some with utility workers to try to have enough to, to run the city. So um, the city of Topeka, in my, in my opinion, has been doing great in, in very tough times. So thanks to everybody at the city who's making that possible. Good night. And as a final parting word, um, if you thought that Momentum 2022 was done, I have news, my friends, it's not. Tomorrow there's going to be a stakeholder meeting in which we are going to launch our MO 2027. We don't know what we're going to call it yet and what's going to come and emerge from it, but the strategic planning of the Greater Topeka Partnership in partnership, pardon the redundancy, with our community stakeholders and members continues. Um, we keep dreaming. Um, today in the Go Topeka meeting, we heard a lot of exciting things on how Topeka is being recognized. Um, we heard in that meeting that Linda Bryden um, from the Realtor, uh, Real, uh, Realtors Association said that Topeka is considered among the top 12, I think, uh, communities and uh, realtors uh, compared to Waco, Texas and Portland, Oregon. Um, so we are doing good things and those good things are paying off. Um, which is kind of nice. It doesn't mean that we coast. It just means that we work harder so that we keep moving forward our community. So um, just know that our momentum isn't stopping. I think that we're at the point that we're going to accelerate it. So with that, um, it's 8 o'clock, and I know that everybody's going to need a break for a second, but we do have an executive session if the attorney would read the parameters. The motion. Sorry, forgot about microphones. Uh, the motion would be to recess into executive session, not to exceed 30 minutes, to discuss an individual employee's performance pursuant to KSA 75-4319B1. The open meeting will resume in the city council chambers. The following staff are requested to assist the governing body in its deliberations. HR Director Russell and City Attorney Stanley. We have heard the parameters of the executive session. What is the motion of the pleasure of the body? So moved. Second. We have a motion by Councilman Emerson, second by Councilman Dobler. All of those opposed? Vote is opposed. Seeing no opposition votes, the motion carries as unanimous. We, have, we will have a five minute break to allow the room to clear up and also for us to have a, uh, a recess and then we will resume the executive session. That's the postcard in the mail in the district. That's the postcard in the mail in the district. You taping our meeting? Okay, I think we're back on. We are on. We have not concluded the executive session. We are in need of resuming the same executive session for a period not so exceed 30 minutes. If the city attorney could read the parameters of the continuation. The motion again would be to recess into executive session, not to exceed 30 minutes to discuss an individual employee's performance pursuant to KSA 75-4319B1. The open meeting will resume in the city council chambers. The following staff are, continued, are requested to continue existing the governing body, HR Director Russell and City Attorney Stanley. Okay, we've heard. Do we have a motion? So moved. Councilman Emerson, second by Councilman Dobler. All those opposed to this motion, please speak now. We have one person opposing. The rest of the body approves. Uh, having eight votes in favor, the motion carries. We recess into executive session not to exceed 30 minutes. executive session no action has been taken with there being no other items in front of the governing body this meeting is
adjourned. Have a great evening.